Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be doing a little intro into RF power amplifiers. We're gonna be using some RF power amplifiers in an upcoming project that we're going to release here on Altium Academy. But of course, before we do that, I'm gonna run over how these components work, some of the important specifications, and we're gonna look at a couple examples in this video. And then finally, I'm gonna show you the schematics that we're gonna use in our upcoming project. So make sure to hop onto All Team Designer, follow along, and let's get started. So a power amplifier is pretty simple conceptually, and it has a pretty simple job. Basically, I have a signal with some power, we'll call it P in. I then put that into my amplifier, and then it outputs P out. And then I have some supply that I have to put in here. We'll just call this supply. And then of course I have a ground connection. So this is pretty simple. And this is uh, pretty much outlines everything that you would need in order to have a very simple power amplifier. Of course on the component you can have like a digital interface because maybe that interface is going to allow you to configure something like the phase or maybe the gain is programmable. Now the power in and the power out are related by a gain term. Power in is normally measured in the RF world in dBm. So this is decibels with respect to one milliwatt as a reference. This would also be measured in dBm. And then the gain of this power amplifier is equal to P out minus P in. And this is measured in decibels or in dB. You could convert this to a ratio if you want, that's fine. You could convert this into some number of milliwatts of power that you add on to the output if you want, that's fine too. But typically we just use this in terms of dBm, dBm, and then dB. Now these inputs and outputs are generally set to 50 ohms and that's built into the component or at least it should be built into the component. If it's not built into the component then you'll need to use an external impedance matching network. But typically if it's an RF integrated circuit they are going to build it so that the input and the output already have 50 ohm impedance. So that means you as the PCB designer then need to design this trace and this trace to be 50 ohm impedance. Now, to have a stack up to do that, you would basically have signal on the top layer, and then you would wanna have ground on the next layer. And of course, the reason to do that is so that we can set a consistent impedance for these input and output traces. I like to do this on a four layer board, so that means I would have ground, and if it's just a uh, RF system, this might be ground slash power, and then maybe I'll have some control pins or some, uh, some passives or something on the bottom layer. So this would essentially be SIG. So you could do this on a four layer board. In systems where I've done this in the past, there's usually more going on than just control signals. So it ends up typically being four or six layers. There's no limitation in terms of the stack up, just make sure that you design the stack up so that you can hit these impedance values on the input and output. So just like any other component, a power amplifier has limitations on the amount of power that it can accept at its input and the amount of power that it can output through its output pin. So how does this work for a power amplifier? Well, the way it works for a power amplifier is you are essentially drawing power from a supply through a high electron mobility transistor. Your job is to then make sure that you are always operating in the linear range for the transistor system that is built into that component. So we have a few important specifications on the power input and output from a RF amplifier. So I already mentioned the gain and the power output is always going to be P in plus gain as long as you're operating within the linear region. And so your job is to set P in such that you are within the linear region. So there's a few different uh, specifications that we have to pay attention to. And the first one is the 1 dB compression power. And in data sheets, it's normally just labeled P 1 dB. So essentially what that means is that it is the value of input power at which the output signal starts to compress by about one decibel. So just as an example, let's say that this is the output power for a clean sine wave from my amplifier. Eventually, if I start to turn up the input power, 
the output power will eventually start to saturate and it will start to clip over like this. And so we call this compression, meaning the top end of the signal is compressed compared to a clean sine wave. And so this compression limit here defines a power input, which we call the P1 dB limit. This is looking at it in the time domain. But typically, we actually look at this in terms of a transfer function. We don't normally look at it in terms of the time domain. Now, you could measure it looking in the time domain, but it's actually a lot easier if you measure it using a transfer curve. So if we were to draw this out on a graph of P out versus P in, what we're going to find is that the P out and P in relationship is going to scale linearly for quite a bit. And then eventually this curve will start to roll over a little bit. And if I were to then continue drawing out this straight line and tracing it like this, what I will do is I will find one particular P in value where this distance between the black dotted line and the actual output power curve is lower or different by one decibel. Okay, so that is my P1 dB value. And it's right here at this point along the x-axis. So when you're selecting a power amplifier and you're pairing it up to a particular source, you wanna make sure that the input power is somewhere in this region. That's gonna ensure that you get a clean sinusoid out that has minimal harmonic generation and minimal compression. The next specification that's very important is called the third order intercept. So it's sometimes written out as uh, 3OIP, um, P3O, something like this. But essentially, it is the third order intermodulation product intercept point. So I know that's a mouthful, but essentially, what happens when you have a signal that's being put into a power amplifier is that there can be harmonic content generation. So let's just suppose. I'm in the frequency domain here in this graph, and I'm putting in a signal that has some arbitrary bandwidth like this. So this is the signal that I want to put in. This is my P in value. What happens when I start to put in a signal into a component that is inherently nonlinear is I'm going to generate harmonics at different frequencies. So this would be at three F sub zero, this point here would be F sub zero. And then there's going to be intermodulation products, which is essentially going to be something like two F low minus F high. So there will be these intermediate peaks that can then propagate through to the output. And these are called intermodulation products. So the third order intermodulation products will lie right next to the intended bandwidth. And this is particularly important with frequency modulated signals. Because with frequency modulated signals, you have a narrow bandwidth involving two discrete frequencies, and they mix together to generate these products that sit right here and right here. So the third order intercept point arises somewhere well above this P1 dB point. But what this is telling you is it is essentially telling you how big the third order products are going to be in this component. And so you would like for this to be as large as possible. So we want this to be a big number. That means you're gonna get much lower harmonic content generation and you won't start to see it until your input power value gets much larger. So this is really only important if you're not dealing with harmonic signals. It's more important if you're dealing with uh, somewhat broadband signals or with multiple discrete frequencies being fed into a power amplifier simultaneously. So now let's take a look at some example components and I'm gonna specifically show you some components from Hittite Microwave. So let's take a look at some example components here. What I'm gonna do is show you a couple of components from Hittite Microwave, which is now owned by Analog Devices. Now, I really like their microwave components and they're a good example of some of the things that you will typically see from RF integrated circuits. So here I'm taking a look at the HMC637. This is a broadband power amplifier outputting at up to one watt. Here on the left-hand side, you can see the important specifications immediately. So we have a gain of 13 dB. You can see here what our P1 dB value is and our IP3 value. So these are the three important values that you will need because if your source is too powerful and puts out too high of a power output, you will need to drop that power down with an attenuator or you just need to turn down the source. Here, what you'll also notice 
is that the inputs and outputs are already matched to 50 ohms. So that's great. You don't have to manually apply a impedance matching circuit. And then here on the component outline in the uh, functional block diagram, you can see several different pins on this component. Now, a lot of these are no connect pins. So here NIC means no internal connection. These are just for soldering the package. You can also see that we have a couple of different gate voltages here. These gate voltages need to be sequenced. And then here we have RF out and VDD ganged together on the same pin. How do you deal with this when your VDD and your RF out are ganged together on the same pin? Well, what you need to do is use a bias T. So if we just scroll down, they actually give you an example of a bias T here inside of this data sheet. So here in this example application circuit, if I just zoom in, you can see right here where the VDD connection is. And this VDD connection involves essentially an LC filter that applies the VDD voltage to pin 21, and then it also allows the high frequency output to propagate through RF out. This circuit here, or the way it's applied, is called a bias T. And essentially, it only allows the DC voltage to come in and then go to the left through pin 21. And then it only allows the RF output to go right through the capacitor over here in this direction to the right. That's how you would power up this particular component. Now also, again, you need to then power this up in a specific order. You can see here that it lists the power up bias sequence right here. Now this bias sequence could be applied manually, such as with jumpers. You could also do this using a power supply sequencer circuit, or if you had a processor with multiple enable pins and then multiple power supplies external to the processor, you could essentially power up the enable pins on your different supplies, which will then sequence on this power amplifier in the correct order. Now, let's take a look at another one. This is another example of a power amplifier. It's not as broadband, but you can see it's got higher power output. And you can see here what the frequency range is. So this one will go all the way up to 8.5 gigahertz. And just so you're aware, Hittite Microwave has this huge range of power amplifiers that cover all sorts of different frequency ranges. If you can think it up, they probably have a power amplifier for it. Here you can see in this one, it's got much higher gain, 28 dB you can see that you have, again, several gate voltages that all need to be sequenced in a particular order. You'll also see here that there is a dedicated VDD pin. So keep that in mind because you do need to use multiple power supplies for these pins. It's not like they're all built into the component. So make sure you check the data sheet because when you're using one of these, you may have to then put all of those individual supplies external to the component and add those into your schematics. Now, if you scroll down here and then just look for the bias sequence, you'll essentially see something similar where you need to power on one of the gates and then you need to power on the other ones and then power on VDD up to the desired supply voltage. So here you can see manually connect to ground, then power up the VGGs, then power up VDD. And then finally, you have to increase these VGG values until you get a typical output current of 2.2 amps. And then you can apply your input. So these are actually a bit complex to power up. And this is where you would then need to either do all of this manually if this was a test board, or you need to have the right power supply sequencing built into your processor, as well as some external power supplies or even a power supply sequencer chip so that you can get all of these voltages into this component in the correct order. So I jumped into Altium Designer to create a schematic for an upcoming project based on some of the components that we looked at. So the component that we looked at earlier in the video was the HMC637, and you can see it right here. Here I've got my gate voltages and VDD hooked up, and my input is coming from a VCO. Now the VCO has a fixed tuning voltage because I've hooked it directly up to this rail, but you could modify this so that it's adjustable. One thing that's good to do in working with these components is just to leave a note here that includes the power up bias sequence. Uh, the other thing that I've done here is, of course, I have this regulator putting out on two different rails. I've got a couple indicator LEDs for each rail. 
And then here's my 5 volt rail for uh, one of the gate voltages. And the way I'm toggling these voltages is I have some 2 pin headers here. So these 2 pin headers can be bridged directly just with a jumper. Or what you can do is you can modulate the voltage going into VGG1 using an external power supply. Now remember, VGG1 is adjusted until the output current hits a particular value. So using a pin header here allows you to just make a direct connection or hook up through a power supply. So we're going to use these schematics in an upcoming video and we'll actually do a PCB layout with these components and we'll then also play around with an antenna module that we will power up through this uh, power amplifier. So make sure to tune in to the upcoming videos to check all this out. Thanks for watching everybody. I know that RF power amplifiers can be a bit tricky sometimes and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about these components. So make sure to leave your questions in the comments section and I'll do my best to answer them. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and you'll be able to keep up with all of our tutorials as they come out, including the project that we're gonna do soon that involves an RF power amplifier. And last but not least, East. Don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.